good. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 12. The message this morning is the unpardonable sin. I want you to think on that. The unpardonable sin. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 31. The divine text says, Wherefore I say to you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Father, bless this word now. Lord, give this messenger unction so that I can preach it. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. I admit freely at the very beginning of this that this is heavy stuff, but it's very important. Of all the preaching that I've done for 47 years in this church, I'll never preach a message that's more important than what you're going to hear right now. It's very important. As a matter of fact, I'll try to touch on some of the main points to give you kind of a panoramic view of what's going on. There's a lot of issues involved, but I want to call your attention to the text itself for what it says. In verse number 32, Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. What does that mean? But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor the world to come. Now there are those who say that if you speak against tongues, that you've committed the unpardonable sin. There are those that say if you speak against the gifts of the Spirit as they define them, then you have committed the unpardonable sin. Of course, when you make a statement like that, then you give carte blanche to anything that you decide to do and call it the work of the Holy Spirit of God. We'll leave that where it is. But here this morning, I want to talk about something that's far more important than whether you speak in tongues or not, and that is the eternity of your soul, the eternity of where you're going when you leave this world. Where are you going? The Lord Jesus Christ said something here in Matthew chapter number 12 that begs us to deal with it. There is a sin so heinous that there is no forgiveness for it. Just the other day, this young woman in Georgia was mercilessly murdered. I don't know exactly the details involved with it, but this man came up from, came across the border, illegal alien, and he murdered this young woman and took her life away from her. That is a heinous sin. My dear friend, that's the kind of sin where you should forfeit your life for taking the life of that young woman like that. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, it says in the book of Moses. And so my dear friend, anyone would have no problem by saying that certainly is a heinous sin. But the truth of the matter is, that's not the unpardonable sin. When you deal with Manasseh in the Old Testament, a king who had apostatized, he was born of Hezekiah during that period of time where God added years to the life of Hezekiah. He was a reprobate and a godless man. And there was no way you would imagine that God could forgive the sin of a man like that who was involved in child sacrifice, letting babies be burned to Moloch. He got that from Solomon, who brought it into the country. You'd say, surely there could be no forgiveness for a heinous sin like that. But that's not the unpardonable sin. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then allowed his, one, of his, one of his troops, one of his officers, to be on the front line, withdraw his troops from him, and let Uriah die at the hands of the enemy, knowing that what was going to happen, that was a heinous sin. It was treachery in its worst form. But that is not the unpardonable sin. I talked to a man on the phone the other day for at length and prayed with him. And he was, he was literally, he was, he was tortured by a sin that he had committed decades ago, a long time ago. And it was literally eating away at his very soul. And he said to me, he thought he had committed a sin that God could not forgive. That is not the unpardonable sin. It is therefore important for us to understand that the unpardonable sin must be something that is so heinous, so vile, so corrupt, that in the eyes of God there is no way in the world that he would forgive it. There, 
sitting in here this house this morning. Maybe you're watching this thing online. Maybe you've committed something in the past and it eats you alive. 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, you've carried it all of your life and it's eating at you and eating at you and eating at you. And Satan, of course, is using it to beat you to death. And you believe that you've committed this unpardonable sin. Well, I'm going to tell you something this morning. You listen carefully to what I'm preaching. And I believe you'll find out that you have not committed the unpardonable sin. Why? Because you're breathing and you're here. And you're listening to what this preacher has to say. You are not forgiven because you live right. There's a lot of people that are preaching that garbage to people. And they say, well, if you live right in the sight of God and do the right things, then God will forgive you. He doesn't forgive you because of how you live. That's a reward. And forgiveness is not based on a reward. There are those that believe you're forgiven because, because that you give. You sacrifice. I mean, you've paid. I mean, you've, you know, you've sacrificed your life for the Lord. Therefore, God is obligated to forgive you. When you pray, no, not in any sense, because that is purchasing the forgiveness and God does not repay forgiveness like that. Then you, there are those that believe that forgiveness uh, is uh, because of somebody's, what they've said over you or what they've done to you or you've been accepted into a group or you've been confirmed or this or that. Someone's laid hands upon you and you felt good about it when it happened. But my dear friend, that has to do with men, that has to do with presumption, and it has nothing to do with the actual forgiveness of sin. So what is it, dear preacher friend, that causes us to be able to be forgiven? What is the basis of our forgiveness? What washes our sins away? What, what is the only thing in this sight of God that can remove guilt, condemnation from a man? And that, my friend, is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only name on the face of this earth where God will forgive sin only by his son. The apostle Paul in the third chapter of the book of Romans in only three verses loads it with powerful statements by saying this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified <coughs> freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. I, I say to you this morning that this apostle loaded these few verses with powerful statements. He said this, being justified freely by his grace. That's a legal declaration. In a court of law, as far as God's concerned, you are no longer guilty. Satan can no longer condemn you for what you've done. The Bible says through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeemed you, bought you back. You belong to him now. You don't belong to yourself any longer. Satan doesn't own you. The Lord Jesus Christ owns me. Lock, stock, and barrel. The Bible says to the, and has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood. Propitiation has to do with the relationship of one with another. It is an appeasement. It has something to ta take away the wrath, something to take away the condemnation, the feelings of one toward another, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass, trespasses unto them. That is the propitiation. The Lord Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He's the one that makes peace between God and man. And then the Bible says to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is not your righteousness. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is not attained by man. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. You can't tell, you can't have it. The only way that that righteousness could ever work for you is if you are in Christ Jesus the Lord. Once you are put in Christ, his righteousness is set to your account and covers your sins. And the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is a unique righteousness. It's a righteousness unlike any righteousness on the face of this earth. It is the righteousness of an obedient a man who was sinless, who lived a sinless, obedient life 2,000 years ago. And he obtained by his 
perfect life, a righteousness that did not exist until that time. And it is the righteousness of the God man. There is everything else is a joke compared to his righteousness. The finest man that ever lived on this earth, whoever he might be, is still a joke compared to the righteousness of the Son of God. His righteousness is pure and holy and undefiled. And the only way that that righteousness will count for you is if by faith you receive him into your soul and he receives you into him. So the Apostle Paul makes it clear that this righteousness is something that we can have. Now, don't you look at men, for example. Look at the Jewish leaders of the day in Matthew chapter number 12, verse 14. The scripture says that they set about to destroy him. They wanted to do away with the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, preacher, was it because he was some a horrible criminal? No, in John 11, verse number 48, it gives you the motive of why they wanted to do away with Christ. Here's what they said. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Now watch this. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Did you notice that? It had nothing to do with high morality. It had nothing to do with a righteous obedience unto God. It had everything to do with their own personal place. And this was their motive in rejecting Christ. You see, my dear friend, the Lord Jesus Christ searches the heart and the soul and the reins. The living Son of God, once you're presented with him, goes deep into the very soul of who you are. And he goes there by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the one with the Lord Jesus Christ that searches the reins, tries the heart, reads the mind, judges the life and the motives. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, by his very being, becomes the judge of all men. Not that he judges them actively. It's simply the fact that he exists. And once you are presented with Christ, he becomes a judge of all that is in your life. So the Jewish leaders rejected him. The Jewish people said in John 19, verse number 15. In John chapter 19, verse 15, look at this. The scripture says, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. There is Caesar, Caesar. He's always been around. He'll always be around. Well, that was to know, my dear friend, Caesar is as much on his throne today as he was 2,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. If you want some of the greatest wisdom that you'll ever get from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, it rises no higher than what I'm about to tell you. If you're a wise person this morning and have half a brain, you'll hear what I'm about to say. You render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. The Lord Jesus said that, amen, 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 and amen. And so what Caesar giveth, Caesar can take away. Caesar has his Rex Romana. What is that? That is the king. Caesar has his Lex Romana. What is that? That's his law. Caesar has his Pax Romana. What is that? That is his peace. He controls every part, every aspect, every piece of your being, of your coming and your going. And if let alone, Caesar will absolutely and completely take you and dominate every part of your being. This is why you live in a republic governed by law. Go to that law and go to the founding fathers and resurrect once again the purpose of this great nation and what it's all about. Amen. And I'm not talking Republican, and I'm not talking Democrat. I'm talking American. Amen. And then there is Christ. Let's look at him. In Luke chapter number 23 and verse number 34, look what it says. Luke 23, verse number 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots for it. Now I want you to buckle up with me because we're about to delve into it now. In Luke chapter number 23, he said, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. What he said was they're ignorant, forgive them. Did you hear that? They are ignorant, forgive them. We're talking about the unpardonable sin. Did they speak a word against the Son of God? Did this crowd standing at the foot of the cross yell at him? Did they mock him? Did they make fun of him? Sure they did. They cursed him. No question about it. In the book of Acts chapter number 9, the Bible says Saul of Tarsus had gone and he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters. He was in a rage is what that word breathing means. Was he screaming against the Lord Jesus Christ? Was he threatening his name? Was he speaking a word against the Son of God? Of course he was, absolutely. He said later on in the book of Acts, I thought within myself to do such and so. An awful lot of stuff gets done because someone thinks within themselves and they take it as the word of God. Try the spirits, dear friend. That's one of the marks of maturity is when you begin to try them. Oh, I hear voices, preacher. Yeah, I hear voices too. We all hear voices. Sometimes we had bad supper. Sometimes we had pizza. Some of this, that, this, that, this, that. But sometimes it may be the voice of God. But you need to know how to try the spirits. Amen. That's very important. Breathing out. But you notice a very interesting thing. Very interesting. You don't have to be told that you're a sinner. You know that by nature. And God does not have to tell you that you are a sinner. You know that by nature. Now, these are two strong things I just said to you. They're very powerful statements. You don't have to be told by the Lord God himself that you're a sinner, do you? No, 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 no. You say, I met somebody that says they're not a sinner. They're ready for the funny farm. I want to be as nice as I know how. You're crazy. You, you've lost it. You've gone off the deep end. You're living in a make-believe fantasy world. Go tell that to a 20-year-old, not a 77-year-old. I've been in this world way too long. I know people. A perfect man is not walking the face of this earth. We are sinners to the very core. But by the grace of God, we can have fellowship with the Lord. That's what 1 John 1 about. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. The Bible says if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves. The Bible says if you say you have not sinned, you make God a liar. So keep that in mind. So you say, well, then what's the point then? It's useless. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. There's power in what I'm saying to walk with the Lord. So you don't need God to tell you that you're a sinner. Now look at John chapter number 16, verse number 7. Don't forget what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the unpardonable sin. John chapter 16, verse number 7. John 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come... He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now get those three right there. They're very important, folks. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now the simple statement in verse number 9, look carefully. He didn't say that he would reprove the world of sin. Satan will have you running after your sins. Satan will wear you out about your sins, but he'll never take you to the one who can take care of the sin. The Lord Jesus Christ is not nearly as concerned about sins as he is the sin. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the what? Sin of the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins unto them, but hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. The Lord Jesus Christ came to this world to deal with the issue of sin. Individual sins will be taken care of once the sin is taken care of. This is why the Holy Spirit came. He came for a specific reason, a ministry to deal with the hearts of men about the issue of sin, not sins. This is not condoning sins. 
But the problem with men, and I know men, and you know them too, and you know yourself. Everybody's got their list of do's and don'ts. Everybody's got their list of the things that they do and the things that they don't do. And there are no two lists to agree unless you, live, unless you go to a church where everybody's brainwashed and only one person's doing the thinking. And everybody, everybody, uh, come, everybody uh, uh, copies what's coming out of the pulpit. No, you all have your list. You all have your convictions. You all have certain things you do and you don't do. Now, there's nothing wrong with these things. But these things, dear friend, have nothing to do with your relationship with the Lord. Your relationship with the Lord is based upon who Jesus Christ is in your soul and your life. Amen. Who is he to you? Convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. You see, it is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that is the message of the Holy Spirit of God. When the Holy Ghost comes, you'll always know it because Christ is glorified and he's made real to you. Amen. It's as clear as you sitting in this house this morning. If the Holy Spirit of God comes to you, it won't be that you'll be saying, well, I'm the Spirit here, the Spirit there, this, that. No, it'll be Christ in you who comes alive. There can be joy. There can be conviction. There can be perseverance. There can be everything that goes with the fruit of the Spirit. But the Spirit will always glorify Christ the Lord Jesus. So when he has come, he will convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. I want you to notice what he says here. Now, that's important. Verse number eight, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. What do you mean of righteousness? He will reprove this world of the world's righteousness compared to the righteousness of a sinless, perfect man. Don't compare yourselves with yourselves. You're not wise. You can always find some poor old slob in worse shape than you are. There's always some old devil out there that you can kick around and make you pump up your self-righteous ego, feel good. You've been in churches where it's full of self-righteous ego. You've been around them? You talk about a dead bunch. That's as dead as it comes. Amen. Give me a bunch of sinners that know how to get right with God. I'll take it any day of the week. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> and so he says here, he will reprove the world of sin because they believe not only of righteousness and then of judgment. This has to do with the God man. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world 2,000 years ago, he won the qualifications. He became qualified to judge Satan and men as a man. Amen. <laughs> Let that sink in. Your judgment at the judgment seat of Christ will be by the God man. The man Christ Jesus. There's one God the Bible says. And one mediator between God and men. Amen. The confessional booth. That's not it. Prayer meeting. That's not it. Pastor. Deacon board. That's not it. There is one God. One mediator. Between God and men. What does it say? The man. Christ Jesus. He has earned the right. To represent all mankind in the sight of God. He has earned the right to judge all mankind in the sight of God. And he came into Satan's territory as a man. And he defeated Satan as a man. And in his weakness he went to the cross. And there at the cross he made a show of him openly. And Satan lost the battle to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what we're talking about. And this is so important. This is so important. It seems so simple in some ways it is, but it is so important. So therefore, the work of the Holy Spirit of God is to make the Lord Jesus Christ everything there is about who you are or want to be and what your, your sins, they're all related to him in one way or another. Can he cleanse me? Can he forgive me? Can he redeem me? Can he restore me? Yes, he can. He can. You can't restore yourself. A man can't restore you. But Christ Jesus the Lord can. Now the book of Romans chapter number 10, which is a powerful statement that has to do with the righteousness of Christ. 
Here's what it says. Romans chapter number 10. Romans 10. And look at this in verses 6 through 8. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith that the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is Lord is what that means. He's the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now look at this text in Romans 10. Who shall ascend into the mountain of the hill of God, it says in the Old Testament. He that is righteous. In plain words, the apostle that Paul is telling you in Romans 10, that if you believe in your heart that Christ was so perfect, so holy because of the sinless life that he lived, that he can ascend into the very presence of God. By faith in that righteousness, you can be saved. That's what he's telling you. And he's telling you that if you do not believe that, you may believe he's a good teacher, you may believe he's a great man, but if you do not believe in his righteousness where he could ascend into the presence of God, you're not saved. You can't be saved. What you've done is reject the witness of the Holy Spirit, which we'll get into in just a moment. The prince of this world is judged. His religions, his wisdom, his person, and everything that has to do with him. It's all judged. Now listen carefully to my statement. Just breathe for a second when I tell you this. You cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God if he's not present. Okay? Let that sink in. If the Holy Spirit of God is not present, there can be no conviction. Conviction comes from God. It doesn't come from your feeling bad about what you've done. Everybody can feel bad about what they've done. Their conscience can give them remorse. Okay? It takes far more than your conscience to get you right with God. It takes the Holy Spirit of God. He said, I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll send the Spirit. And when he has come, John chapter number 16, he will guide you into all truth. We have a tendency in our proud arrogance to think that we can organize and we can set about to get something done for God and we can just go push our way into it and get it done, you know, and so forth and so on. You can't do it. Because you cannot do what only the Holy Spirit can do. We need to be praying seriously about the Holy Spirit of God coming down upon sinners. That's what happened to me in 1973. One day I'm sitting here, I'm lost without God, I have no, I have no desire for God, I'm just as dead in my sins as I can possibly be. And the next day something came on me that I had never had come on me before. I was under conviction. My world turned dark. I had a dread and a fear come up in my soul. Something had was changed inside me. I had to have peace. I had to get out of it. I had to do something about this. It didn't make any difference what people thought. I couldn't live like this. And all I had to do was bow my head and Lord Jesus come into my soul, cleanse me and save me, and I raised my head back up and it's all gone. And I've been a new creature in Christ Jesus ever since then. That's conviction. They don't preach conviction anymore. Churches don't preach anything about conviction because they don't preach anything about repentance. They don't preach of repentance and they don't preach conviction because they don't preach the new birth. The reason your pastor is not preaching the new birth is because he's never been born again. The reason the pastors, the ministers, the bishops of these assemblies out here are not preaching the new birth to people because they've never been saved. Sure, they've been to Bible college. Sure, they've been to seminaries. Sure, they've been taught. Sure, they know all of that stuff. Sure, they do. And there's nothing wrong with it. I've been through it too. But my dear friend, that does not make you saved. Amen. Now, think what I just told you. Without the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's no conviction. There is no conviction. There is none. When the gospel is preached, the living word brings the living spirit. That brings us to the gospel. Listen carefully to the statement now. The gospel is the final witness and testimony to Christ's finished work. I want to ask you a question. I know I'm going to be mean for a minute, but I want you to answer me. 
Did the disciples believe that Christ would rise from the dead before the resurrection? Were they believers, though? Sure they were. Simon Peter, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, my Father, which is in heaven. All right. But it was a limited knowledge. It was a limited understanding. See, in John chapter number 20 and verse number 9, it says, They knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Even though he told them, they still could not take hold of it. And, of course, all of you know the story of Thomas. All right, but here's, the, I'm making a point. I mean, I'm trying to show you progression now. Look at progression, all right? Now, it wasn't until after the resurrection that the message became clear. They saw him once he had risen from the dead, and now he was alive. There was no question about it. He was alive. Now, look what Paul says about that in 1 Corinthians 15. This is after the resurrection. This is after the ascension. This is after the glorification. This is Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. This is Christ now, the Lord Jesus, waiting until he comes back again to receive us unto himself. And the Apostle Paul says, I want to declare unto you the gospel. All right, here's the gospel, Paul said. Post-resurrection gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you've received and wherein you stand. Now watch how simple this is now. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you've believed in vain. Now look at this. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. Now, before we jump further, hold on a minute. Does anything change about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in John chapter number 16? When he has come, he'll convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. No, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. This gospel is a verbal declaration of the finished work of Christ, what he did at the cross. It's done. But the work of the Holy Spirit is inside the heart. Here's a picture of it. Look at the book of Acts. There's a fellow over there by the name of Felix. You heard about Felix? Felix. Acts chapter 24 and verse number 25. Now if you look at verse 24 in the text, it says, In certain days Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. All right, here we are. Here's the faith in Christ. See? All right, now the Apostle Paul is not preaching like you're reading in 1 Corinthians 15, to, recorded, but he certainly has preached the gospel to him. There's no doubt in my mind. He preached the gospel to Felix. How many of you believe that he believed the death, preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to Felix? Well, what would he preach? Of course he did. But look how it... Look, how it, look, look what it did to Felix. This is the work of the Holy Spirit now. You remember John 16? Look at this. Verse number 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, whose righteousness? Temperance and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The ancient historians say this of Felix. He reveled in cruelty and lust and wielded the power of a king with a mind of a slave. That's Felix. Now, do you see what's going on? There's a dual thing going on here, okay? Here's the dual thing. The apostle Paul preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. If he didn't preach that, he didn't preach the gospel. But when he preached that, the Holy Spirit of God did his work inside the heart. See this? He did his work inside the heart of Felix, see? And he brought righteousness, temperance, and judgment. See that? See the work? There's the dual work. There's the preaching of the, of the gospel, and then there's the work of the Holy Spirit who takes that preaching of the gospel, and he goes inside that individual, and he begins to plow. <laughs> and he begins to open him up. That's what happened to Felix. I doubt if he'd ever had this happen before. 
This man was trembling. He's a procurator. And he's trembling. He's shaking. Why? Because he has now come under conviction. He's a prime candidate now to be saved. He could have been saved right on the spot. The Apostle Paul had preached to him. He could have been saved, but he wasn't, was he? And there's no text, there's nothing in the scripture anywhere that tells us that he ever did or in secular history. It's a sad thing because he was given the opportunity. And there he was. Of course, uh, you know, hyper-Calvinism wouldn't appreciate this a bit, but the truth of the matter is he was given the opportunity and he rejected it. So how did he die? What kind of sin did he commit here? What kind of sin did Felix commit? Unpardonable, folks. There's no pardon. There's no pardon, right? Because there's nothing greater. There's no higher court. There's nothing higher than that. The Lord Jesus Christ is the end of all. He's it. He's it. That's as high as you go. You don't go any higher. You've rejected him. That's it. There's nowhere left. You reject him based upon the fact that you have been convicted by the Holy Ghost and been given the opportunity to believe. Isn't that something? So this preacher believes, and of course, you know, you don't have to agree with me, but this preacher believes that to leave this world in a state of unbelief in Christ, to reject him, to knowingly reject him, having been convicted, and the Holy Ghost has come upon you and brought conviction, and you willfully, knowingly reject that and die in that state. You got no hope. There's no hope. Neither in this world or the world to come. Anybody in the house this morning? Has God spoken to you? Have you been convicted this morning? Has, has he taken all of your religion and said, it's not worth it, is it? All your religious experience, it's no good because look at your life. You have no fruit. You've never had any joy in Christ. He's never really been what he should be in your life. But he can be. Hallelujah, he can be. Say, so how can he's alive? That's how he can be. Amen. Would you like to come down here this morning and have someone pray with you? We'd be glad to. We'd be glad to. This is what this is all about. That's what the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is, folks, as far as I'm concerned. That's the way I see it. That's the way I see it. Let's bow your heads for a minute. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, I brought what you gave me. I got peace, Lord, as any messenger would have. Lord, I've delivered my soul. Now I can go home and rest. But I pray for your word now as it goes forth. I pray it will, it will accomplish that which you please. We've sowed good seed. We've put the word out now. The word will do the job. Oh, yes, it will. It may not respond right now. They, they may not. But they may go home or they may go to work tomorrow. They may get in the car about driving. And then this begins to speak to them and starts working on them. And they begin to think about this. That's good. That's a good thing. And it brings them to the point to where they need to make a decision because they get gets a hold of them and they've got to do something about it anybody raise your hand nobody looking but just raise your hand and say preacher I, you know you got my attention this morning God bless you God bless you God bless you amen I'm glad that's that's what I'm here for got your attention and something something's resonating with you isn't it something speaking to you something's something's beginning to take root in your soul God bless you God bless you well, that's a good thing, folks. That's a good thing. Good thing. Good. Good, good. And I'm explaining it very plainly as I know how. I am not the Savior. I cannot save you. I'm the messenger. Christ is the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, what a Savior he is. Hallelujah to God. What a Savior. What a Savior. What a Savior. Anybody else raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Anybody, pray for me. I will I'll be glad to. Lord, we pray now. Pray for those who raise their hand the house today. We pray for them. Lord Jesus, your word has gone forth. It's way past me. It's past any ability I have. It's way past me. Your word has gone forth. Now bless it, Lord, and anoint it. Give it unction. In thy name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand up here this morning, brother.